I shot him about here and he swerved over to where he is now and the bike dropped and he started screaming out so I let another two rounds into him. We had the opportunity to interview a mass murderer. He wanted to tell his story so we tried to find out as much as we could about him and about why he did what he did. Hoddle Street in Clifton Hill is a major road in Melbourne. It basically connects the north and the south parts and thousands of cars go past there every day of the week. There are train lines that uh, go down virtually following Hoddle Street and uh, they carry thousands of people every day. Crime-wise, uh, look, like a lot of the inner city suburbs, Clifton Hill had more than their share of house breakings, burglaries, that sort of thing. But it was, it was a pretty good suburb and, and still is. It's only a short distance from the inner city area. Certainly Clifton Hill was never noted for a high crime, um, from my memory of the area, more of a sleepy hollow than anything. On the evening of the 9th of August, 1987, that tranquility would be shattered by an act of unspeakable and unfathomable violence. Chef Andrew Hack was heading out for an evening shift at the restaurant where he worked. I was driving down Heidelberg Road, heading towards Clifton Hill, towards the city, and uh, got towards Clifton Hill Station, and, and then I took a left turn down onto Hoddle Street. Um, normally, I would go straight over the overpass there. As I was driving down the ramp, I remember seeing a police car further down the road with sort of flashing lights, I'm not thinking anything of it. You know, just driving along and the music was, you know, quite loud listening to that. Railway signalman Wayne Monaghan was also preparing for a long evening shift in the signal box that was located next to Clifton Hill Railway Station. Before I got to work, I got Kentucky Fried Chicken. And there was no microwaves in those days or cookers or anything like that. So put the Kentucky Fried Chicken under the food warmer then uh, heard noises, gunshots, went back in the signal box. I rang the signal at an A box, he wouldn't answer the phone. I rang Metrol, which was a train control centre. They didn't know what was going on, I just said, I'm getting out of here. Wayne left his signal box situated next to Hoddle Street and the unfolding chaos. He took cover nearby and waited for the police to arrive. I remember seeing a car with like sparks. Something had fallen off the car, it looked like something had fell off from underneath the car onto the road. And I didn't think anything of that. Um, just kept driving. Then I flattened out on Hoddle Street there and then I just heard this almighty bang. And I remember looking at myself and my shirt and there was just was blood all over my shirt. My body was numb, pins and needles feeling. Andrew Hack had unwittingly driven into what was to become one of Australia's most shocking crimes. It was just after 9.30 p.m. and someone was firing randomly at cars on Hoddle Street. By then, at least two people were already dead and countless wounded. 24-year-old Vesna Markovska had been shot multiple times when she got out of her car after it had been hit by one of the gunman's first shots. She was a broadcaster and theatre performer. She had spent that weekend celebrating her father's birthday. Moments later, 27-year-old Englishman Robert Mitchell was shot in the head as he tried to help Vesna. He had only moved to Australia the previous year and worked as the state manager for a stationery company. Lying nearby, Gina Papayanu was critically injured after being shot in the side. Gina was in her final year as an art student at Monash University and hoped to be a lawyer in the future. I was down with one of my crew doing some work in uh, St Kilda and I heard some commotion on the radio in the police car and uh, Clifton Hill at that stage was probably six or seven kilometres from our location. They knew because my call sign that I'd uh, held the rank of sergeant they asked for me to attend at the scene at that time. The basic information was that there was uh, a man randomly shooting at vehicles. As drivers approached the gunman, hidden in undergrowth, they came under fire. 
In the chaos, many thought their cars had been hit by stones thrown up by other vehicles. They were tragically wrong. Over 100 rounds of ammunition would be fired at innocent people that night. He was, to a certain extent, like the hunter with uh, a spotlight on a rabbit. He just picked off whoever came in his sights. This is Melbourne, a peaceful town, peaceful city. And all of a sudden, bullets are whizzing past. These bullets in cars and uh, these cars reversing into other cars and uh, people uh, under extreme shock. As vehicles and passengers were hit, in a killing zone of less than 400 metres, several people were wounded by flying glass and shrapnel, but were able to drive to safety. I started getting some feeling in my fingers and, and all that. And then I looked out the side, out of the car onto the footpath, and I noticed two people laying on the side of the road, not knowing what had happened. They were slumped over each other. and I opened my door and I thought I wanted to go and see what was wrong. And at this stage, I still didn't know that I'd been shot. And I walked to the front of my car, which is probably about five metres to the front of my car, and um, then I heard another, another noise, another bang. And it was quite loud, it was deafening. And then that's when I realised that someone was actually shooting. So I sort of panicked a bit, got back into my car, started to drive. I might put my hand down to my, my side and I remember putting my hand in a hole on the side of my, my, side of my back. Despite life-threatening injuries, Andrew fled the scene and managed to get help at a nearby restaurant. Back on Hoddle Street, the gunman had claimed more lives. 53-year-old brewery worker Duzan Flajnik was killed as he drove into gunfire. His car was struck by two bullets, one of which lodged in his chest. He bled to death alone in his car, with his family learning of his death only after seeing television footage of the scene. Seconds later, John Muscat, a Clifton Hill local, left a friend's house nearby after hearing gunfire and going to investigate. He was shot multiple times as he crossed Hoddle Street, hit in the arms, chest and head. In the midst of the chaos, police officers were beginning to arrive. A number of police cars stopped um, in and around Hoddle Street, around Ramsden Street, where the railway station is. The only thing that was apparent was that someone was taking shots at vehicles or people, and no one knew where the location of that person was, how many people were involved, what the situation was. It was just, um, um, no one knew. There was no answer. You could hear the shots, you didn't know where they were coming from. You, you knew at that stage a number of people had already been shot. You could see some carnage on Hoddle Street. We'd had a very quiet night up to that point, but um, there was a man with a gun in Hoddle Street shooting, um, and they wanted us to get overhead and see what we could do. So we responded as quickly as we could, got the aircraft out, started up and flew down over the area. The police did not know how many people were there. The police did not know really where the shots were coming from. One moment they thought the shots were up near the signal box near Ramsden Street and Hoddle Street. The next minute the shots are closer to the railway station. Uh, so there was a great deal of confusion and the, the police that were there, generally speaking, had never confronted a scene like that in their working life. What's going on here? This is not Melbourne. This is, um, this was a war zone. This was something that, uh, it was spooky. It was very spooky. The only noise you heard was the occasional wailing of a police siren or the shots being fired by this lunatic. Tragically, a number of those shots were aimed at another car traveling on Hoddle Street that night. The Skinner family were returning from a birthday party when their car came under fire. 23-year-old mother Tracy was sitting in the passenger seat, holding her son on her lap, when their vehicle was hit by several bullets. As she placed her child in the relative safety of the footwell, she was shot in the head and died instantly. 
Incredibly, her husband drove the car to a nearby petrol station and safety. Their 18-month-old son survived. Moments later, 22-year-old postal worker Shane Stanton, riding his motorbike along Hoddle Street, was caught in a hail of gunfire. He was riding to work, but ironically was unaware he was on a rostered day off and not due in until the following night. Well, I think my first recollection was actually seeing the motorbike uh, laying on its side in the middle of Hoddle Street and then a couple of cars uh, parked in, at various spots on Hoddle Street. Now, what drew my attention as we were looking and, and listening to these uh, uh, shots going off, hearing all of the radio transmission, which was non-stop, the helicopter above, up in the distance, I saw what I thought was someone certainly lying on the ground or in the gutter, waving an arm. The figure desperately signalling to the police was Gina Papayanu. She'd been lying on the road in urgent need of medical attention for over 20 minutes. There was a set of headlights on a motor car that was stopped, so I could see the silhouette of this movement as a result of the headlights on that car. So I said, there's someone up there, and you, you could see them moving. So uh, four of us jumped in the car. Uh, we didn't have bulletproof vests or anything in those days, and so we drove up there with our heads under the dashboard. And for some reason, we just felt that the shots were coming from the railway station area. So we parked across the front of where this, this young female was lying to afford us a bit of protection, as well as her, who was conscious, who, and I've said this to a lot of people, her injuries were best described as being attacked by a shark. Basically, half, a, half the side of the body was just an open, uh, massive wound. We had uh, nothing that we could support her with as far as um, first aid. There was nothing we could do other than just, I guess, hold her hand and talk to her and comfort her. As soon as it was deemed safe, paramedics rushed to Gina's aid. There was one young girl there who had been shot but still still alive, and so we uh, we treated her, um, and um, she was a lovely lady, and was even considering the the horrific things that had happened to her. So we treated her, loaded her into the ambulance, and, uh, and the police officer drove us to the hospital. Gina's family maintained a round-the-clock vigil for their daughter and sister, but despite doctors' best efforts, she would lose her fight for life in hospital 11 days later. She was only 21 and was mortally wounded trying to help others caught up in the massacre. Back on Hoddle Street, the random shooting continued. However, as more police officers arrived at the scene, it was apparent that they themselves had become the target. The shooting was still going on spasmodically. It wasn't every one or two minutes. It'd be periods of no, no gun sound at all. One stage, uh, the helicopter got hit with one of the rounds. I believe he fired three shots, but one hit the aircraft. Um, and incredibly, it was right below where I was sitting. The shock wave that went through my feet and my legs was unbelievable. The pain was incredible. If it had been sort of half a millimetre forward, it would have actually split the fuel bladder and caused sparking with all the wires, so, uh, all the electrical stuff. So it could have been interesting. Narrowly avoiding a huge explosion, the crew managed to safely land the helicopter in a nearby field. Back on Hoddle Street, and as police began to take control of the scene, the shooting was growing more sporadic, and it was apparent the gunman was on the move. He was able to observe from the bushes and the trees that were along the creek line, the Merry Creek, um, generally speaking where the police were and any other obstacles. And uh, he followed it and he eventually came out into the street. There was a police officer there directing traffic, he shot at the police officer. Now that police officer was not injured because the, the, the bullet actually went through his jacket, burnt his shirt and put a mark on his skin. One of the police who were on duty uh, happened to see a figure dart uh, in the distance. They chased after him and the next moment they are under gunfire themselves. 
He took refuge behind a brick wall and shot at the police officers in the police car. That's when he ran out of ammunition and the police officers who were shot at called on him to drop his gun. He did that after he'd finished uh, shooting and gave himself up. The offender, who was behind a, a blue stone wall, if I remember correctly, threw his arms up in the air, screaming out, don't shoot, don't shoot, and the police then arrested him and handcuffed him. This ignominious act brought to an end one of the most brutal crimes Australia had ever witnessed. Confronted with a normal suburban street that was now littered with bodies and abandoned vehicles, police had to determine who exactly this man was and why he would destroy so many innocent lives for no apparent reason. In a move that confounded detectives, the suspect now in custody was more than happy to talk. We were told that um, at least one person had been uh, shooting at cars in Hoddle Street and that there were a number of people who were dead, but we still didn't know for sure how many, and that there were many others injured. Uh, beyond that, that was probably all we had. The offender in question, currently sitting quietly in an interview room at St Kilda Road Police Station, was a 19-year-old disgraced Army officer cadet called Julian Knight. And what's more, he was willing to tell detectives exactly what he had done. It was fascinating um, to interview in this circumstance where the person wanted to tell the story, couldn't wait to tell the story. It was sort of clinical, almost military, the way he was debriefing. And it felt like he was excited to tell the story. Look what I did. I did this, I did this, I did this. And it was sort of interesting and, uh, and on reflection, a, you know, a bit scary. To the amazement of the police during several interviews lasting almost 12 hours, Julian Knight took the detective step by step through his nefarious actions that evening and even explained his reasons for carrying out the attack. We had the opportunity to interview a mass murderer. He wanted to tell his story. So we tried to find out as much as we could about him and about why he did what he did. It's just a science target thing. Prior to the shooting, uh, he had troubles with his Tirana motor car. He was having trouble uh, changing gears. Um, a former girlfriend was having a party and he wasn't invited to the party, which upset him. He went to the uh, local hotel nearby and he had some beer there with uh, one or two other people. And according to them, he didn't drink a great deal. He chatted up a barmaid and made reference to the fact that she had a scar on her face and he commented that he's got lots of scars on his body and then went back to his home he went to his bedroom, he retrieved his guns. He had three weapons, a 22 rifle, a shotgun, and a high-powered military rifle. He pulled them out, he got his gun belts, his ammunition, loaded up um, magazines. You could argue that the shotgun and the 22 could be used for hunting rabbits, foxes, uh, but the M14, it's designed purely and simply for military purposes to kill another human being. He then stepped us through how he went uh, out of his home uh, across the road, which is adjacent, parallel to the railway line, uh, across the railway line onto a little reserve beside the railway track uh, and, and that abutted on Hoddle Street. A spot where he had a good view north and south of the traffic. It's quite a wide street, pretty well lit. He then told us how he simply how he started shooting at the people in the cars. So uh, picking them off as they drove along um, with the intent to kill. I mean, we took him to that point in our questioning, you know, why we were we shooting at the cars or the people? He said he was shooting at the people. Why were you shooting at the people? I was shooting at them to kill them. Very clear about that. By shooting at them, was it your intention to kill them? Yeah. The people in the car. 
This chilling admission was just the first insight into the mind of Julian Knight. He talked about the idea of wanting to know what it was like to shoot someone. I wanted to know what it was like to kill someone. I wanted to be involved in a theatre of war. I wanted to be involved in combat. These are things that he said. Um, however, <laughs> when the time came, when the police called on him, he, he actually did give up then. Was it your intent to shoot the policemen, to kill them? No. What was your intent when you were firing at them? No, I thought they'd shoot back. Mm -hmm. I wanted SOG to come because I didn't particularly want to, you know, lie bleeding in the gutter with a 38 slug in my, in my heart. Mm. Coughing blood, I preferred SOG to take my head right off. Mm -hmm. There's nothing brave about the man at all. Um, it because he was shooting at uh, people in their cars who were unarmed and didn't even know he was there. We saw nothing at all in his demeanour in terms of re regret or remorse. Not nothing. Um, the nearest thing to that was when the newspapers arrived and they were starting to put the stories very quickly into the newspapers and we showed him a newspaper and he looked at it. And he got angry because they had some of the facts wrong. But he said something like, no, this is bullshit, they've got this all wrong, you know. That said a fair bit that this was all about him. Immature, self-obsessed, uh, by no means psychotic, not at all. He was very clear-eyed, very clear-minded. Um, just a very nasty person. As detectives pressed on, determined to find some reason for Julian Knight's abhorrent actions on Hoddle Street, the survivors and witnesses' personal battles were only just beginning. I was approached by uh, various people in the community and their solicitors who wanted to refer survivors of Hoddle Street, that is, people that had witnessed the shooting, people that had been shot and uh, survived, uh, for treatment. To a person, they were suffering uh, elements of post-traumatic stress disorder. Some were experiencing major grief um, they were depressed, they were having nightmares, generically, flashbacks. And of course, this was front page news for a very long time. So it wouldn't go away in their consciousness because every day they'd read more about night and all the rest of it. Unfortunately for some, the awful events that they had experienced and the way they were treated in the immediate aftermath would have lasting effects. They took me down to Fitzroy North Police Station and done a statement there and um, they let us go. We had no way of getting back because I asked the police, how are we going to get back to our cars? And they brought us back in a divvy van and dropped us off on the other side of um, where Knight shot everyone and we had to walk past the whole lot, all the bodies, the whole lot, with another policeman. So you could still see all the people in the cars and lying on the ground and all that. I was a young fella, 19 years old. To be honest with you, a, a a little bit of, once I got better, a little bit of a media attention. I, I sort of enjoyed it. I thought, you know, but deep down inside, I was, I was suffering. I just hated myself and just, I didn't want to go on. I did take up drinking very seriously because I didn't worry about life anymore. I didn't worry about dying anymore. As well as the civilians caught up in the tragedy, first responders too were severely affected. At that stage, there, were, there was never any real emphasis on either psychological or um, um, operational debriefing. And so, as it turned out, because there was a need for work to be done afterwards, um, we probably had about 20 minutes to, to clean up and sort of get ourselves together a little bit at the hospital, and we got a call to go to a, an asthmatic patient, you know, five minutes away. It was something that uh, the police here haven't or hadn't experienced, to my knowledge, before August 1987. The tactics and, and the response teams that the police now have compared to, you know, 20 odd years ago have changed dramatically. So I think they'd be certainly more prepared or well prepared. But how do you prepare for a lunatic who walks out on the street with a gun and starts shooting blatantly at anything that moves? I don't know. The first step in answering that question was to explore the background of Julian Knight, to try and piece together the events in his life that led directly to the massacre on Hoddle Street. 
He was an adopted child. Um, his father was in the military. He was a captain. Linguistics, Chinese, I think, was his specialty. His mother was a delightful person. He was raised in a very loving environment. Um, he attended a number of different high schools, and part of the reason for that was to find a school that had a cadet corps. The young Julian Knight was obsessed with the military, and despite his father being against the idea, he successfully applied for a place at the Royal Military College at Duntroon, where he trained to be an army officer. He was known as a, uh, a person from the wrong side of the tracks, and uh, so he would be referred to continuously in the pejorative, in a negative way, and he was bullied and bastardised. And uh, as a disciplinary measure, uh, he was confined to barracks on the weekend, and he saw this as another form of bullying. And uh, there was a particular Saturday night that he went AWOL, absent without leave, and went to a local nightclub in Canberra known as The Bin, which I think still exists. And the person that he felt was bastardising him was there, and Knight stabbed him. Uh, arising from that, and Knight was also injured in that incident, he was placed in hospital. His father then intervened as best he could, and Knight was discharged from the army, awaiting a court-martial. So he went straight from that military environment back to his home at Clifton Hill, where he felt doubly disenfranchised because a lot of his old friends rejected him. Uh, they had a view about him joining the army and the fact that it hadn't worked for him uh, just galvanised that view, I guess. And uh, so he was really uh, a very disenfranchised teenager, lonely and angry and uh, dealing with the loss of his life project, which was to be an officer and a gentleman. So the point in saying that about his history is, in other words, talking about why he got booted out of the military, trouble with his girlfriend, trouble with his car, had had a few drinks. The point in talking about that is we wanted to cover off on those as not being the reasons that triggered a psychotic episode. And, and we were able to do that, and that was important to be able to say, well, there's no psychosis here, there's no psychotic episode, he's not mad. So in lay terms, you might be describing him as crazy. Um, um, in medico-legal terms, he was not. He was sane, uh, he certainly had a personality disorder, he was sane. I guess in common parlance, he's a person who uh, is well-oriented in time, place and person, there's no madness there. And clearly, as the uh, crime demonstrates, there was a lot of badness at the time. Perpetrators of mass shootings rarely live to tell their version of events. After Hoddle Street, Knight was able to do just that. And detectives went one step further. They took him back to the scene, where, in graphic detail, the gunman relived the horror of that evening. You had the 22 uh, in my left hand, and the shotgun in the right, and the M14 slung over my shoulder by a sling. In uh, circumstances where someone is talking, if we can, we want to cover off on what we have to prove. So, for example, we want to be able to prove his intention while he was shooting at the people in the car. So, explicit questions about that. Okay, so when you were shooting, what were you shooting at? I was shooting at the people in the car. What, did, what was your intention in relation to them? Kill them. Why did you want to kill them? I don't know. So proving his intent to kill is an important thing. So that was that was um, important for us to take him to those questions. And his answers were important so far as proving goes. So I didn't see um, them get it out. I just saw her on the road, and that's when I shot her. Um, and then I, she fell back on the road, and I let off another two, and then um, Someone else came out and um, I dropped that one as well. Right. And, and when you fired at them, uh, what was your intent? Kill them. Why did you want to kill them? I don't know. Uh, can I say that was really chilling. At the time, for me personally, I was in work mode. Um, when I look back on it, I think this is a remarkable uh, piece of an interview. So he steps us through almost. So. Um, Brian McCarthy, my uh, senior sergeant, took the lead in the investigations and asked him questions along the way. Essentially, though, he took us through another form of debrief at the scene. So he was able to show us 
where he was when he started, um, where he first started shooting, that person, that person. Uh, in one example, he describes that he could hear the person screaming. I shot him about here and he swerved over to where he is now and the bike dropped and he started screaming out, so I let another two rounds into him. I think he used words like, I put him out of his misery. So I shot him again to kill him. What was your intent when you shot him? Kill him. Do you know why you wanted to kill him? No. The confession is only a beginning to an investigation. And in this case, in, in, um, in one sense, the investigation started with the confession. As the whole of Australia came to terms with the dreadful events on Hoddle Street, the public's thoughts turned to a trial. How would Julian Knight defend his actions in front of a jury and in the court of public opinion? We walked in, sat down, and I was oh, maybe two metres, three metres away. He was sitting in a box, and um, it started. And um, the committal hearing, basically, it just, the judge will read out how each person was was killed. And um, I remember getting, there was um, a young lady, uh, Tracy Skinner, I think her name was, who was, 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 was killed. And her partner was in front of me. And I remember him, when it was read out, he said, you know, something to night. You know, it was quite nasty, quite rude, which he probably deserved. But, I remember Knight just turning around at, to him and just giving him a smirk, you know, smirking at him like, you know, bad luck sort of thing or whatever. But that was, um, that was pretty bad. Six months later, survivors, witnesses and relatives of the deceased were spared the trauma of a trial when Knight pleaded guilty to seven counts of murder and 46 counts of attempted murder. Eventually, uh, he agreed to, uh, I guess we'd describe it as a plea bargain. But if he pleaded guilty, uh, he would get a life sentence with a minimum of 27 years. And that would spare the community the trauma of a very protracted trial. It would spare the victims uh, the trauma of having to relive the event in the witness box and be cross-examined about it. There was a sense of relief when we learned about this because if you think about how we might have had to run a trial and put all of those um, victims through a trial, families um, and the rest of it, that would have been horrendous. However, it was never really um, an option. He, he was pleading guilty from the start. Um, he pleaded guilty to all the charges and um, his plea, whilst it was put as well as it could have been by his counsel, uh, was pretty lame. Um, the uh, prosecutor was able to paint the picture about what happened and talk about um, what might have you know, been behind it in terms of saying there was no psychosis, there was no insanity. This was just a person with a bit of a personality disorder um, and a very immature man who chose to go out and kill people because he wanted to see what that was like. In November 1988, Julian Knight was sentenced to a minimum of 27 years for the massacre on Hoddle Street. To many, his sentence was an insult. The fact that it, after murdering seven people, let alone the untold number of people that were injured physically or mentally, or both, that he could potentially be walking the streets of Melbourne again after 27 years was um, just a grave, sentencing error. It came over the news and the radio later that day and said that he'd been um, sentenced to life with a minimum you know, parole period of 27 years, um, which back then I thought, you know, life, you'll never get out, but I didn't know the parole sort of period. I think back then you had to give someone a parole period just to just give them a bit of hope. But I remember my mum ringing me and telling me that, you know, it's. It's not enough, it's not enough, you know, it should be life forever. And so that was, that was, that was tough, but um, 27 years, you know, 28 years now is gone, and um, I, it's gone so quick. So now we, we, hopefully we can just um, put it behind us and keep him in, in jail. Further angering survivors and witnesses of the terrible events on Hoddle Street has been Knight's behaviour in prison. I said to him when he was 19, pull your head in, 
you're a 19 year old, if you don't create problems in the prison, there's a chance that you might get parole when you're 46. People may excuse you on the basis of your youth. But of course, Knight has remained in the public light since that time, for all the wrong reasons. He should never be released. And the thing about uh, what people don't realise, he's caused nothing but trouble the whole time he's been in jail. He, you know, the self-appointed uh, president of the, the prisoners' rights group. And uh, uh, he's been branded here as a, um, as a pest to the court system. That served as a constant reminder of the original atrocity that he committed. And consequently, people, I think, now are angrier about him and what happened than, in fact, they were 27, 28 years ago because uh, it's been constantly reinforced that he's there and what he did and so on, and uh, he hasn't knuckled under. Always protesting about the rights of prisoners and, and the duties and, and his own innocence and all those sorts of things. So, no, he's... Uh, he deserves to stay until he can rot in hell, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think he'll be released. I think the um, political climate has changed so dramatically since 1987. Um, the antipathy towards him has intensified almost exponentially. Back then, the city was in shock. We've had, you know, all this time to process it, and he's been in the public eye intermittently over the past three decades or so. A lot of the times it is focused on him. Uh, we need to focus a lot on the survivors and the victims and how they're coping. And, and we all hate it. We all hate seeing his name in the news. We need to just shut him up and just uh, hopefully he can just never talk about it again. In 2014, the law that refers to parole was changed specifically relating to Julian Knight. The amendment meant he will be eligible for parole only if he is in imminent danger of dying or is seriously incapacitated, and as a result, no longer has the physical ability to harm any person. I interviewed him in early 2015, and uh, I was retained in past years to review him every five years for the parole board, but I had not seen him for quite a number of years. And for the first time ever, and I always question him about, are you sorry for this? Is there any remorse? And uh, for the first time ever, he said he was very sorry for what he had done. I'm always skeptical about expressions of remorse. I've seen thousands of people, and I'm yet to meet somebody that doesn't express remorse. The difference is they normally express it at the moment they're caught. Uh, with this man, it's taken in ex nearly three decades uh, for him to actually say he was sorry for what happened. So I thought it was significant and in all likelihood genuine, as best I could tell, certainly appropriate. Despite this admission, Knight has never provided any explanation for his actions on Hoddle Street, other than his morbid desire to experience combat and killing. I have a theory that uh, it was really the confluence of um, anger, un unrequited ambition, being bullied, alcohol, and access to firearms. And following Hoddle Street, I became uh, quite vocal about the need for better arm control in this country, because I think it's arguable that had he not had access to those guns, Hoddle Street may never have happened. We had this um, Hoddle Street shootings where seven people were killed and many more injured. In Victoria, not far away, in, in fact, in the city, uh, we had the Queen Street shootings where a number of, quite a number of people were killed. Uh, followed later by Port Arthur, it is in another state. So for me, I've always had a profound dislike for firearms and I see no reason at all for the legislation to provide access to high-powered military weapons for people here. Uh, I grew up in a rural area and I absolutely understand the need for farmers to have a 22 rifle, maybe a shotgun, to deal with vermin. The idea that people can have high-powered military weapons um, is just, a, for me, a complete nonsense. Despite almost three decades having passed since that cold August night that claimed the lives of seven people, the mental scars of the Hoddle Street Massacre still remain. It has had a really profound effect on some people, and, and, and I understand that when it sort of 
read some of the some of their stories. It really shocked Melbourne and brought into Melbourne some real horror, some real terror uh, that this could happen. And even to this day, I um, it affects me. You know, it does, and um, I don't sort of talk to it much with my family because I don't want to uh, upset them, even though they know what I've been through, and it's uh, yeah, it, it's hard. So every day, regular Australians going about their business, good people, all of them, and so some of them pulled up because they saw what was happened, they saw people injured, they got out to help and they were shot. Um, and I think uh, every one of those is a tragedy. It changed my life, it did. You know, I, I didn't know whether I was gonna die or you know, I survived and I'm lucky.